The powerful demon inside the hero. It's an anime trope as old as time. Naruto and the Nine Tails, Asta and Black Clover, Ichigo and Bleach, Inuyasha, Chainsaw Man, the list goes on and on and on. And if you've watched any anime, like ever, you will know that the main character always, always has to face his inner demon, overcome it, and then in the end, grow stronger. You know. It's a metaphor. And so it's actually quite refreshing that Jutsu Kaisen took this particular anime trope, like so many others, and completely flipped it on its head, as Itadori Yuji is just crushed over and over again by the far stronger and far smarter Sukuna. However, what if Yuji was more like the rest of shonen protagonists and could actually learn to control Sukuna and make use of his truly insane powers? Because this one change would make the entire story of Jutsu Kaisen completely different. So, when normal but very very strong high school student Yuji Itadori finds himself face to face with a monstrous curse terrorizing his friends, he makes a split-second decision that changes his entire life. As you'll remember, he eats a special great cursed object, aka one of the 20 fingers of Sukuna, and as Gojo reminds us, this isn't counting toes yet. Sukuna has four arms because he's just built different. And normally, this should kill him instantly, but Yuji is a super strong special shonen protagonist, so instead he emerges as a suitable vessel for Sukuna. The problem is, Yuji isn't actually able to access any of Sukuna's insane powers, he can just take back control of his body and suppress Sukuna inside of him. But what would it be like if instead of just being able to take back control of his body, Yuji could actually just directly access Sukuna's insane powers? And well, first off, I think Satoru Gojo would just end up being a lot more suspicious of this whole situation. In the regular story, he fought with Sukuna for 10 seconds as a test to see if Yuji could actually take control at will. But if if regular Yuji was also as strong as Sukuna without him taking over, he'd probably be a lot more likely to think Sukuna was just acting with his best Yuji impression to trick them into thinking that he was actually being suppressed. Yuji would just let slashes fly, giving Gojo about a million cuts that he'd have to heal with his reverse curse technique, and Gojo would probably end up asking Yuji a series of questions that only the real Yuji could actually know. For example, he'd probably ask stuff like, what's your birthday? What's your mother's maiden name. It's Kenjaku. What's the name of the street you grew up on, you know? And then of course Megumi would yell at his sensei because of course neither of them would have any clue themselves what the answers to those questions would actually be. And the higher ups in particular would want Yuji even more that than they already do, just like they did in the regular story. After all, the one thing possibly more dangerous than a resurrected ancient curse user is a teenager with unlimited power. However, after Gojo was fully satisfied that it was indeed Yuji in control, he would still vouch for him and convince the higher-ups. After all, he is Gojo and he could simply stop Yuji if he went rogue since he only had one finger's worth of power at this point. Of course, only shortly after, Yuji's power level would start growing to two fingers as Gojo would give him another one that Jutsu Hai had been holding onto as a means of testing his ability as a vessel. And as you know, with each finger that Sukuna regains, his total power grows. However, in the regular story, this doesn't at all affect Yuji's base power. He still very much needs to work on developing his own strength from zero because he's completely unable to tap into Sukuna's well of power. In our scenario though, all of that finger power may as well be Yuji's because he can now use it without actually having to give up control of Sukuna at all. And so now let's flash forward to Yuji's next big moment. For a lot of fans, the point where they realized that Jutsu Kaisen was not their standard series was when the main character near literally died in just the sixth episode. However, in this timeline, with Yuji actually getting access to Sukuna's powers without him totally losing control, things would go very differently when the special great cursed spirit showed up spawning from the cursed womb. In case you don't remember, this cursed womb then became a special great spirit called a finger bearer specifically because it had consumed one of Sukuna's fingers. And so now, instead of Yuji, Megumi, and Nobara's only options being to run or die, 
this time Itadori would have the power to actually fight. Now, in the actual show, Sukuna made really short work of this powerful cursed spirit, but in exchange, Yuji lost control of his body and Sukuna was able to take him hostage. AKA ripping out his actual heart and threatening to kill him, only offering to use his reverse curse technique to heal him if he'll actually make a binding vow. And this vow, unknown to Yuji since he literally had to forget about it due to the conditions of that bargain, would have terrible, terrible consequences down the line. However, if Yuji could use Sukuna's strength without the downsides, he'd eliminate the cursed spirits pretty much with no problem. Sukuna showed the cursed womb his domain expansion, but since Yuji wouldn't even know what that was at this point, he probably just put the cursed spirit through the slap, chop, and cut it into a million cursed pieces kind of treatment. And then the gang of the three would all be free to grab a bowl of ramen afterwards. But of course, that's not the only thing that Yuji gets to chow down on, because he'd also be free to chomp on yet another Sukuna finger that was housed inside the cursed womb. Once again, this would bring Yuji to a power level of exactly three fingers at this point. And as you remember, it's around the same time that Jogo would actually try to kill Gojo. However, this time Yuji wouldn't be in secret training since, well, he didn't fake die. I'm going to say that Gojo would probably still have him do his Netflix binge watch training program thing to try and have him get a hang of cursed energy. And as Yuji's finger number increases more and more, the wrist of Sukuna gaining control would be higher and higher. So having him complete his cursed energy training would be especially important here. After all, even if Sukuna didn't take control, somebody without experience trying to use his powers might very much cause untold destruction just by accident. So anyways, Mr. Volcano Head here would want to have a serious word with Gojo, foolishly thinking that he was even remotely a match for him. And by the way, I really wish that his name was actually just Mr. Volcano Head. That way I wouldn't just have to keep getting Jogo and Gojo mixed up in my script all the time. So uh, thanks Gege for that, I guess. And just like in the main series, Gojo would use this opportunity to teach Yuji about the wonderful world of domain expansions. This time though, after seeing Gojo's unlimited void in action, Yuji would just say, oh, oh, let me try that and whip out a malevolent shrine. Or as a Crunchyroll likes to call it, I guess, a malevolent kitchen. Oof. However, Jogo isn't getting cooked just yet. We'll save that for Shibuya. Because outclassed by not just one, but two Jutsu sorcerers at this point, Jogo would once again flee the scene with the help of his most flat friend and decide that maybe, just maybe, he does need Kenjaku's help with Gojo after all. And so on to Junpei in the real timeline of Jujutsu Kaisen, Yuji befriends a high school student called Junpei. Unfortunately though, this guy Junpei had also made another friend recently, Mahito the Human Curse. And just to be clear here, that's not like a human slash curse combo like Sukuna. Mahito is a curse born from humanity's fear of itself, making him one of the scariest curses altogether. Now, due to Junpei's parents being divorced and his constant bullying at school, he has adopted an extremely negative view of humanity. And Mahito takes advantage of this, but Yuji genuinely tries to become Junpei's friend. However, as you'll remember, this short arc accumulates in a huge battle at Junpei's high school when Mahito uses his idol transfiguration to turn Junpei into a monster who he can use against Yuji. And at least according to Mahito himself, there is no way to bring Junpei back to life. Yuji begs Sukuna for help because he does know that Sukuna can masterfully heal wounds. After all, he just replaced Yuji's entire heart with reversed curse technique. However, in the real series, Sukuna and Mahito just laugh and mock Yuji in one of the most memorable panels from the whole series. I mean, Gigi Akutami really knows how to draw a really demented smile, I guess. However, if Yuji could actually control Sukuna's powers, that would include his reversed curse technique. And using that power, he could probably reverse Mahito ability. Mahito states that it's impossible to do so, but for all we know, Mahito just says that to harm Yuji even more, and maybe with the power of someone like Sukuna, it might be possible after all. And at this point, I think it would be nice if Jutsu Kaisen took a cue from One Piece, because Mahito would make an excellent shocked anal face as Junpei was being deep platypus, I guess. In fact, he'd be so in shock that he'd barely see it coming when Yuji pulled out the death by 1000 cuts. Now, Mahito can change the shape of souls, but his soul would be in about a billion trazillion pieces after Yuji was done with him here. Because in our case, Yuji would be able to fight against him with the full strength of Sukuna, aka Maito is getting cooked in the Malevolent Kitchen. After all, Yuji is no match for Maito at this point in the story, but 
Sukuna's powers outclass him by miles. And as you can imagine, Mahito being super dead at this point is going to really come into play a lot later, you know, because of Shibuya. But for now, Junpei and Yuji would celebrate, Junpei realizing the errors of his ways after Mahito took advantage of him, and the two teenagers would go, you know, catch a movie where absolutely no heads exploded. Up next, we get a family reunion where Itadori gets to meet his siblings. Enter the Cursed Womb Death Paintings. Now, these guys are kind of like the Cursed Wombs from earlier, only way worse. They were created by Kenjaku, the ultimate villain of Jutsu Kaisen, who was inhabiting the body of Noritoshi Kamo, who gained the title of the most evil sorcerer in history. And in order to create the death paintings, he mixed the blood of cursed spirits and humans to create creatures who were a kind of hybrid form of both. And since Kenjaku is also Yuji's mother, <laughs> long story, this does make Izo, Kechisu, and Chozo here technically his brothers. Step brothers, half brothers, curse brothers. And once again, the team of Megumi, Kugizaki, and Yuji will destroy these guys here, and Yuji will slurp up yet another delicious finger. And at this point, it's of course the moment that you've all been waiting for. Happy Halloween, because in Jutsu Kaisen time, it is October 31st, the night of the Shibuya incident. And as you might suspect, this is where the differences in our scenario really start coming along heavily, because Yuji has already destroyed Kenjaku's plans here. Mahito was essential for helping keep Gojo busy and distracted so that he could trick him into getting caught by the prison realm. Mahito also kills fan favorites Nanamin and probably Nobura. And I mean, come on, Gege Akutami, would it kill you to just let let us know what actually happened to our favorite hammer girl already. Anyways, in this scenario, the disaster curses are especially motivated to get rid of Gojo and Yuji because they need Gojo clear so they can fulfill their goal of taking out humanity and letting curses rule the world. The group would probably still somehow manage to successfully capture Gojo, but less thanks to the disaster curses like in the actual story and much more thanks to the human disaster Kenjaku or pseudo Geto as Gojo sees him. And so again, most most likely the world's strongest sorcerer would be caught in the prison realm, leaving the rest of the fighters to deal with the three special great curses and their allies. Chozo would still fight Yuji and slow him down from being able to set Gojo free before the prison realm was sealed, allowing Gojo to actually still be captured. Once again, Chozo would use his blood manipulation to fire off rounds at Yuji, but he dodged them all with ease. And just before Yuji uses his Sukuna powers to just absolutely chop up Chozo to pieces, they would realize that they are actually brothers. Now, Yuji would be very confused, but glad to accept another ally on their side as the two go down to face the remaining disaster curses. Now, during this arc, Mimiko and Nanako would still feed Yuji a finger. These two girls were followers of Suguru Geto prior to his death and therefore wanted to offer a finger as an offering to Sukuna so that they could actually ask him to kill Kenjaku for them since he had taken over their old master's body. It does get very confusing, I know. Now, in the actual story, Sukuna ends up killing them, Receiving them giving him an order as an unforgivable offense. However, Yuji will be more than happy to use the finger boost to go after Kenjaku, especially since Kenjaku just imprisoned his own master. And so the ever polite Yuji would just bow deeply after getting the gift of another finger and then go running off after Kenjaku. On the other hand, Jogo would absolutely not give Yuji the 10 fingers that he has been hoarding. Since the King of Curses Sukuna was essentially being held hostage by Yuji in this alternate timeline, he would want those fingers as far away from Yuji as he could possibly get them. And so instead, in our timeline, it would essentially come down to an all-out battle between the disaster curses, Kenjaku, and Yuji's five-finger death punch. However, Yuji would have the backing of the other Jutsu sorceress. Of course, Hanami, the nature curse, was already exercised by Gojo before he was even trapped in the prison realm. Dagon, the water-based curse, would still be a problem, but just like he does in the regular series, the recently resurrected Toji Fushi Shiguro would still be there to help beat the curse up into a pulp, and so Jogo would actually end up being the biggest problem of the three. Now, 15 Finger Sukuna actually made pretty short work of him, but this time Yuji would only have five fingers worth of strength here. And therefore, I think he wouldn't be able to just absolutely flex on Mr. Volcano Hat here with his own fire-based attack. Instead, Yuji would actually 
actually use his regular strategy of dicing and slicing and punching, I guess, to turn Jogo into minced meat. And so at this point, all that's really left is Kenjaku, but after seeing everything that had just gone down, well, let's just say that Kenjaku is probably smart enough to read the room and know when to dip. Getting up close and personal with the combat isn't really Kenjaku's usual style. This dude can absolutely fight if he needs to, but he's not trying to take on all of Jutsu High plus a Sukuna strengthened Yuji at the same time. After all, he is quite cunning and manipulative. He likes to make plans and have others enact them for him. But he has a real problem, because since he's now lost Mahito, his biggest strategy for enacting the culling game by stealing his ability was already gone as well. And therefore, having succeeded in his goal of sealing Gojo, he would retreat to gather new allies and fight another day. Now sadly, that would mean that he wouldn't get to reunite with his beloved son Yuji just yet, but it would only be a matter of time before he would get things to go his way once again. Of course, if Yuji did have control of Sukuna's powers, the show wouldn't be nearly as interesting unless they gave Yuji an enemy who was truly on his level. Because think about it, if Sukuna's power were on the side of good, what character in the world could possibly rival him? Well, I mean, I guess there is Satoru Gojo. Now, thankfully, he is on the good side as well, but if his backstory had gone just a little bit differently, could his insane power have gotten to his head and made him go against Jutsu society? What would it actually have looked like if Gojo had turned evil? Well, to find the answer to that question, you can watch that video right here. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.